Stacey Jones Hill. I am a co-founder and the communications director of the Hollywood Fringe Festival. Um, and I like talking in the creative workshops about how when I first started Fringe, I considered myself an artist and a writer. And they said, you can write all the newsletters and press releases. And I was like, great, that's what my heart has always desired. Um, so I really enjoy the creative series because it's very personally inspiring to me too. I really love hearing about people's creative processes and like, it's really cool. I love hearing about the stories that, that people present and why they choose to do it and the struggles that bring them on their journey. And that's kind of here what we're, we're going to talk about. So if you guys don't mind, maybe introduce yourself and talk about how you got into music and, um, and then maybe how you got into Fringe. Uh, my name is Zachary Bernstein. Um, I wrote and musical directed and co-produced Disastroid uh, last year. And how did I get into music? Well, yeah. I mean, how how did you get into your art? Like, how, like I think it's good for people to know like where you're coming from a little bit. It was. Uh, I started young. I just picked up instruments. I'm not uh, not really a trained musician, I just, but I've, I'm a very prolific songwriter. Um, after college, I toured around the country uh, as a singer songwriter. And but in college, I majored in script writing and. So musicals were, were inevitable, <laughs> uh, and I wrote one and did it at Fringe last summer. And how'd it go for you? It went very well, Okay. I would say. I'm glad to hear that. I would say it was a modest hit, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have the lovely Miss Laura. Hi, uh, my name is Laura Wiley. Um, I've written quite a few. I. Uh, I did the comp composition for video games in Fringe 2015, and then I wrote Winter is Coming, Game of Thrones musical in 2016, and then I wrote Buffy Kills Edward in 20... Oh no, I'm getting these dates wrong. 2017? Yes. 2018 was this year. 2018 I did <laughs> Sex... Oh my god, I can't get them straight. Sex in the Musical was a Sex in the City musical, and I currently am working on Just the Worst, a musical parody of The Real World, which is at Serial Killers right now competing. We're on episode two. Um, I actually got into this, I'll tell you, I used to be a singer-songwriter as well. I had all these original albums growing up as a kid, and I had kind of put that aside because I was like, I was going to be a serious person, I wasn't going to do music. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, and then when my friends asked me to do the video games, I was like, I don't know how to score anything. They're like, can you play video game songs? So I, I wrote a score, and that was kind of my first attempt at writing something that wasn't, you know, singer-songwriter type thing. And then the next year, they actually asked me, they were like, why don't you write a musical? I was like, write a musical, okay. It's a thing people do. But it's kind of weird. You know, once you get inspired by an idea, it does kind of just start going crazy. I, I can't explain it. I wrote it very fast. I wrote the whole show in a month because I was just really inspired once we started talking about it and throwing out ideas. Um, and it kind of just develops. So, yeah, this is what I do now, like, full time, which is really bananas. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Grady Welch. Uh, I'm a co-writer, co-producer of The People vs. Hellcross. Uh, it's a heavy metal musical comedy. Um, the lead singer of the band. Um, and I come from a very musical theater heavy family, but I was never a musical theater person. I was always into rock and roll. And... Uh, and then when I started doing comedy again a couple years ago at Second City, I discovered my love of doing musical comedy and musical theater. And so uh, I co-wrote a musical called Sicky Sicky Narnar Nar Fest. That was like a, it was a, um, yeah, it was a, like Greece goes to 2003 Warp Tour. So it was this like boy and girl, you know, unrequited love, um, sending up of old punk rock. And then, uh, and then the band from that became Hellcross, and we first wrote this show, we actually wrote this and put it up two years ago at the Pack Theater next door. Uh, it's a very different version than our first version, and it's gone through a couple iterations until this last year at Fringe. Um, yeah, so it was, a, it was a strange process. All your shows did pretty well this year. Right? I, I, yeah. mine, mine was okay this year. I would say it wasn't close to like with, with our Game of Thrones and Buffy musical, we sold out really <laughs> hardcore, like standing room only. Oh, really? Um, with Sex and the City, we had good sales, but like it was nothing close. 
And I think I loved it. Well, I will, <laughs> I will say this. I will, I will say this as a writer. It's important to kind of understand that um, brand is very important for Fringe. So Fringe is a very specific kind of thing that they tend to like, and. You can have a great show, and it might not be a huge hit at Fringe, but it could be a huge hit somewhere else. Fringe is just a good place to play with things and try things out. And whether or not the Fringe community in L.A. you know, really embraces it might be a good show to put somewhere else, but you get to workshop it at Fringe. So that's kind of actually what we did with Sex and the Musical. Uh, we actually sold it. So we workshopped it here. It did okay. We sold it, as we also sold Buffy, to uh, some Australian company, and they've been touring with my productions. So that's been pretty that's cool. So, rad. Okay. so it might not always be a hit here, but like there, it's a huge hit. And we've had offers from people in New York too because Sex and City's better in New York. But yeah, yeah. It, was, it was it was modest here. I'm not gonna lie about this year. It was modest audience. It was definitely what I heard people <laughs> talking about a lot, though. People were like, "What about that Sex and the Music?" Uh, it's because we had the unbelievable Ali Miller in our cast, who is kind of a star at Fringe in her own right. Um, I loved having her. I loved working with her. That was. Amazing. You got you had a great cast. Actors are my favorite people. Yeah. I, mean, I would say that, <laughs> and I say this, but I don't know anyone else who says it. But I I say that Disaster Rig was the sleeper hit of the Fringe. I love it. Because <laughs> the that. first the first yeah. half of the run were very modest audiences, mm-hmm. but word of mouth did prevail in the end, and people came to see it towards the end. And I was filling. We were filling houses, and we had some. Award recognition. I mean, uh, we both got nominated for Best Musical, and you won an award for the ripest show at Fringe. So we did okay. We did good this year. Yeah, I mean, we all did all right. <laughs> there were a lot of shows at Fringe, but it's. I mean, it's it's a very competitive environment, right? And so that's. I mean, that's kind of what we're trying to address with creativity. We talk a lot about marketing and networking at Fringe, especially in the spring during those workshops. But this is like the most important piece, right? Is making a show that means something to you and means something to other people. So I kind of want to get into why you guys decided to write the stuff that you write and how you go about it. Because every writer is a little bit different. I know this is kind of a big question, but like, how do you start? Um, and then what do you do? And then how long does it take you before you start involving other people? Um, well, I'll go first. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, the first iteration of Disaster Rate was done in 2012. And I wrote it because my friend wanted to direct a show. My friend Jim, he had never directed a show, but he thought he could do it really well. And he knew I was a writer, so he asked me, can you write a show? And I was like, what about? And he gave me five log lines, and I chose one that kind of gelled for me, which was <laughs> about which was about someone finding out that the world is going to end, and then how are they going to deal with it? Um, and I took it, and I was in a place then that like Laura said, I was able to pump out a first draft in a month. Um, and there were many, many drafts before we put it up in 2012. Uh, and then some years pass by, and I look at it, and I'm like, no, this can be much better. This is not as good as it could have been when we first put it up. Uh, we got you know, a real director, and my friend Jim would not mind if I said that. He stayed <laughs> on. He was my graphic designer for the, for the show. Um, <laughs> Got a real director, workshopped some more, um, put it up in a much better form, and then when we cast, we got a great cast, and with the cast, I kept rewriting it, because when we were staging, we realized, you know, we need this, and we need that to not be there. We need to have a new song, because this song is not appropriate. Um, (laughs) So, you know, I changed a lot. If you, if you see what it was in 2012, and there's video evidence of it in 2012, and if you saw that up against what it became uh, at Fringe after a run at Sacred Fools as a late night show, um, you'd see a much different and a much improved show that I'm more proud to have written. So the whole process is very discouraging because it took like six or seven years total to get to its current state. We talked about this a lot on the last panel that we just did about ensemb- writing for ensembles yeah. and about how our successes are built upon the backs of our failures, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> that's like how, how we get there. Me- so. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm not discouraged enough to Stop. try to write a <laughs> brand new musical from scratch and have it ready next year at Fringe, uh, which I've begun, but I'm like, I should really finish that 
first draft. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say the first time we did Winter is Coming, our Game of Thrones musical at Fringe, it was not great. I mean, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I was like semi-horrified we weren't nominated for anything, but I mean, it wasn't good. I, I watched the video and I was like, and we went through and punched up the script. We actually did another run of it six months later and it was so much better because I realized how many mistakes I made the first time. But you don't know it first, right? Like you make your baby, you love it, and you put it up, and then you like later on in hindsight are like, yeah, that probably, no, that, no, okay. <laughs> and you start to kind of see what needed to be fixed. So I love the idea of multiple drafts. I think one of the most important things about a musical for me, I think so many people are book writers and they want it to be a musical. So they write the book, right? Then they're like, oh, the songs, I'll find somebody. I think it has to start with the songs. You have to find someone you like working with that writes songs that you love. Because to me, I've seen a lot of musicals. I, anyone can tell you, I am the weirdest person at Fringe. I will see every musical. <laughs> uh, last year I saw 42 shows. The year before that I saw 57. I will go see people's shows. And I've seen a lot of musical attempts. And one of the things that I say attempts, when the songs aren't good, I'm kind of tuning out. It doesn't matter how good the book is for me. If there's nothing I can like, you know, kind of jam along to or something that I'm like emotionally drawn into, if there's nothing giving me anything and the songs are just kind of you know, gratuitous, I'm, I'm like, ah. So I think so, it should come from the songs and then the script kind of build around it, if that makes sense. Like, where it makes sense of where these scenes are gonna go because you have these songs that, you know, bring people into the, into the action. Actually, that's something I can say for my colleagues here. I've heard both of their songwriting and they're phenomenal songwriters and I think that's what really makes their show so good. Like, I was getting ready, I was like, eagerly awaiting the next song, like, when's the next song coming? And like, that's how it should be in a musical. Like, oh no, they're gonna sing again. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I've seen shows like that and I was like, oh no. Um, but again, French is a great place to take risks. You it's know? a good yeah. place to try. Like I said, my first show wasn't good. Um, we ended up, my first show, we had 13 songs in a very poorly written script. The second time we did it, it had 22 songs and the script was completely redone and we actually changed a lot. Um, a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, one thing that we did that added, I, I do comedy writing, if you guys can get that, like, I do parodies. So one thing that we thought would be funny for Game of Thrones, we had actors playing more than one character, and lots of jokes about that. So they'd be, like, changing, and then, like, coming back as the next character, and lots of fun kind of play with that. Um, and that was something we didn't have in the first one. We just had 22 actors. Guys, don't ever put 22 actors in a show for I was going to get to it. That's an absolute it. nightmare. <laughs> um, just trying to wrangle them all and then Come stage on. spacing and then just, it, it's an absolute nightmare. Um, Disaster right now had four. They had four. And, they have, and, and it was so funny when they would play lots of different characters. Like, allow your actors to kind of have more to do, you know, and I think that also gives them motivation, you know, as opposed to like, you have a couple lines, they're, they're not going to give you much. Um, actors always want the biggest part, I have found. What do you mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. um, totally. <laughs> so, yeah, I will say the hardest part about musicals for me is the funding. Um, I, I like to kind of spend the money to get it done right, um, which ends up being really costly. And you don't have to. I've seen very bare bones musicals that are amazing just for the integrity of what they are. I just, I, I spend a lot of money. My, my arranger is very expensive. Should also have mentioned that. Um, I do write the songs, but I have an arranger in our company who arranges all the music, brings in a band, makes it like a full thing. So I think that's also really essential to how good our songs are. Because I'm not the best arranger. <laughs> I can write you a song right now, but like arranging for a bass and a drums and guitar. And, and now Laura will sing songs for us. <laughs> <laughs> if you want. We have extra time. I'm totally going back. <laughs> Uh, what was the original question? Laura <laughs> <laughs> went so off point. Yeah. <laughs> kind of, well, no, it's okay. We, we, I think uh, we're just kind of talking about like how you go about it and what... Oh, it, right. And, um, so the origin of our... Well, since our show is about a band, the whole show is about the music itself. It's not like most typical musicals where people are in a scene and then they reach some sort of emotional climax and that carries them into a song. Our show is specifically about the music and the content of the music uh, because we're a, a heavy metal band on trial for our music. Uh, it's a parody of the old PMRC hearings and the Judas Priest lawsuit and the Osborne lawsuit and all that kind of stuff. So that's the origin of the show um, was my two guitar players 
uh, sat down and watched a documentary about the Judas Priest lawsuit where they almost got them on uh, subliminal messages, but they couldn't prove that they intentionally put subliminal messages into the music. Otherwise, they could have been uh, actually convicted of, uh, I don't know, murder, uh, like third degree murder or manslaughter or something, whatever the charge was. Like, it's really crazy. Um, so from there, Jason and Evan wrote uh, metal songs that uh, the content was very explicitly violent or sexual. And the first show was all about us trying to prove that the songs were double entendres and that getting away with murder is not literally about getting away with murder. It's about how media conglomerates and cable companies are murdering your wallet and they're getting away with it. And nothing is cooler than suicide isn't encouraging anybody to commit suicide. It's about how air conditioning is destroying our atmosphere and we are collectively committing suicide. I <laughs> wish I didn't miss this one. Uh, we're we're still still have, this. You still have a chance to see us. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I loved it so much. Thanks. And um, Nate, by the way, I would say of the three of us, like your audiences were like, I mean, you guys sold out every show, right? We were 12 seats away from selling out every show. The whole show. run out. <laughs> It was very close, yeah. It was, it was very successful. Um, so that was the original show. And then when we were going to put it up for Fringe, we realized that the uh, our friends playing the prosecutor and defense attorneys are both very talented singers in their own rights. And we wanted to get as close to a rock opera as we could. So we doubled the number of songs that we originally had. And it wasn't just us performing our songs as evidence we injected some of that more typical musical I'm just going to break into song element to the show. And so now the show has all of these character songs where each of us has a very specific heavy metal archetype that we are and we each have a song that sort of illustrates us as a character as well as songs for opening and closing statements for the lawyers to sing and we have a couple duets in the character songs because like our rhythm guitar <coughs> player... Uh, is is falling in love with the prosecuting attorney, so their song is like a duet. Um, and so we went back and specifically wrote more musical type songs, even though they're still like hard rock heavy metal songs, um, that had a little more of that uh, emotional... Um, they're all very emotionally driven. It's us like bearing our souls as characters, essentially. Um, you guys kind yeah. of narrowed in on a different audience for musical stuff. We really did. You did. Yeah. It was very different from a lot of the other stuff that's been going on. Um, we have a pretty intensely talented group of musicians and artists, I think, in the musical genre now. Like, I remember when we first started, we were like, people are doing musicals at the fringe? Like, why? How can they do this? And this is kind of what I want to get into with you guys now. Is It's so difficult writing a musical as it is. Doing it at Fringe really adds a lot of challenges. On top of it, you have to think about, you know, not having a 22-person cast. Um, oh, my God. Um, the amount of musicians that you can have and, pl and all that sort of yeah. placement. Um, so what do you guys do during the writing process to, like, think about the, the circumstances? Like, do you, or do you? Well, um... Well, I always knew that I, I just wanted to write a show that had very few people in it to begin with. Um, it's the same characters, but the, the original incarnation, uh, uh, my buddy Jim, the director, he, he had the smart idea. It's like, we'll get more people to see it if we don't double up the, the actors and we have more actors in the show. Um, Maybe that helped with ticket sales, but that <laughs> it, it, it's so much wiser to uh, to keep things compact and not make it a long show. A, a lot of people, when they think musical, at what they're probably thinking at Fringe, it's like, wow, they're trying to do you know, Hello Dolly, oh my God, or yeah. they're trying to do that. When there are other ways to make musicals, there are other ways to write songs for shows. They don't all have to sound like. You know, uh, Stephen Sondheim. They don't. The, the Fantastics and, is and only for four characters. <laughs> there you go. Sondheim. But I mean, I specifically wanted to do something that was small, that was 
compact uh, it, with length that it, it didn't you, you didn't get antsy in your seat after a while um, and short. <laughs> oh yeah, that's like a whole thing I'm by sorry. the way. Yeah. I went to a musical one year at Fringe and it was two and a half hours and actually ended up walking out. Um, here's the thing about Fringe. You don't need to do the fully expanded version that you're going to plan to do elsewhere. So like kind of know by the way what you want to do with your show. I always like to know where it's going. Like a lot of people just put stuff up just because it's Fringe. I like to kind of know what it's, what my inevitable plan for it's going to be so that I know kind of lengthwise how, how crazy you go. Um, I usually like to do an hour long musical at Fringe. I think an hour is a good, you know, you get the idea and then if you want to develop it into a longer show for stage, yours was already developed, that's why it was a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, but like mine was a brand new world premiere, so I kept it in an hour to kind of keep it palatable. Because I don't know about how many of you could do Fringes a lot, but like when you're going to like 10 shows a day, I, I can't, I can't do long. <laughs> like I just, Two hours or more is going to kill me. And um, if you have a show that's two hours, you're going to have to spend more money on, like, rehearsing it. You're going to have to... <laughs> there's just more to work on, and the less you have, the more you can hone in on it and polish it and make it better. Just to say this, the musical that won uh, the top of Fringe in 2016, yeah, it was 45 minutes long. So you can win the entire festival in something short. It just has to be good. That's kind of the inevitable thing. So... I like an hour. I always feel like I can get everything I need done in an hour. I think 90 minutes would be my max, probably, because I would, you know, that would That's be... That's even like, becoming more and more rare now, I think, at, at least in our fringe. There's yeah. mo most of the shows, I think, are 60 minutes. Um, the and when they are 90 minutes, you're like, ugh. Oh, yeah, I know. It's like, oh, that extra half an hour. A normal amount of time for any other show. <laughs> <laughs> fringe. I could be showering. I will say there, there's, there's this... People like to kind of judge at fringe when people use tracks. I say whatever works in your budget. Um, if tracks are what works for you, great, depending on especially the size of your space. If live music is important and essential to the show, like his band was part of the show. They were like actors on the set, like on the stage singing and being part of the thing. And with them, obviously the actors and musicians are the same. With Buffy, we had a rock musical, so we had a band. With Sex and the City, it was a techno musical, so we had tracks. Like there's, I, I don't even know how you would do live techno. It's all like, <laughs> I, I would have no idea. Somebody do some beatboxing. <laughs> Push them up. Uh, I did have my music director live there with the keyboard to kind of run the tracks, but yeah, it's it's it depends you can on your show. It a lot of different ways. Like yeah, don't let people tell you like you have to have a band or you have to have tracks. Do whatever works for you for your show. I've gone both ways. Um, we did full tracks for Winter's Coming. We had 22 people on stage. It's never, it's never gonna happen. <laughs> Video games I played live every night on stage on a little keyboard. Um, I think great. also different than these guys, I'm not in my shows. I know that they both were in their shows. Um, so that's also an option. You can write yourself in or I sit on the sidelines. I, I don't Is there like a reason for that? Is it like you're, you're part of your creativity? Like it's funny you say that because um, I don't know if you know Charles Conbury, he's another Fringer guy, but he came up to me the other day after seeing me at work and he's like, why don't you sing in your shows? He was so pissed. Um, the thing is, I, I sing for work. I work at piano bars, so this is kind of a separate thing for me and I don't I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I, <laughs> but I think work. that's really interesting. Like, Good. I perform for work all the time, so like when I'm not working, I don't want to be. Yeah. I love playing drums, and I <laughs> rarely ever get to. So I'm like, hey, I wrote a show. I can be my own drummer. But if you did it all the time, you might not want to. And you got to sing all the harmonies. <laughs> maybe, the maybe the yes. Best. And the, the band <laughs> got to sing the harmonies as well. So um, uh, yeah, I just thought it's also hard to find a drummer who could commit to coming and unloading their drums and then reloading their drums into their car. Just I'll take the brunt of that. Um, because that is a thing you need to consider. Yeah. Oh yeah, load in and load out time. Yeah. yeah, start talking about that. Depending on where your yeah. venue is. You got more gear. Oh god, yeah. your venue. Well, but yeah. Green Clubs gives you half an hour, but that's not much for you guys with like no, a full it's, band. That, it's half an hour including doors. So oh, we true. really had 15 minutes to load everything in, set it up, do sound a check. really quick sound check, and get backstage so they could open doors. It was... We had nothing. <laughs> We were lucky because so Sandy was already kind of part of a lot, our music director is part of a lot of other companies, so she was usually already there. So the only setup was just get the actors inside. Yeah, no, we had Thomas <laughs> oh had God. to set up monitors for us as well, and three microphones, uh, four microphones, 
we have two guitar players, so there's three ampl amplifiers, a whole drum kit. Uh, there was, it was a lot. And to speak on like scaling it down, the original version of our show probably would have clocked in at about 90 minutes, and we ended up cutting two or three songs that I really wish could have stayed in there. We had a we had a whole rap with uh, oh our defense attorney and the judge ended up doing like a Beastie Boys style rap and we ended up cutting that. <laughs> what, what was it? 70 or 75? The, uh, show, the show? It was 60. It was 60? 55, 60. Yeah, it was an hour. Why did I think it was a little, it was just like just over? Because it's so much fun. Because it was so <laughs> rapid. <laughs> um, can I also say something really smart that they did, which is really smart. You always want to think about your audience. They had earplugs when you walked in the door. Because yeah. it's a small space and it's heavy metal. So like they were really thinking about their audience and like really putting that into consideration, which I was very grateful for because I probably would have left without those earplugs. I, I need it. I am very sensitive. Yeah, it was very loud. Was. And that was a big thing in choosing our venue, actually. We can talk on, sort of segue into that a little bit. Um, we, I called a bunch of different venues to line one up. And the first meeting we took was with Allie and Sarah at three clubs. And they were like, you don't need to look at any other venue. This is a bar. You're doing heavy metal. And we're like, oh, yeah. And they're like, please be here. And we're like, all right, we're not going to go to any other venue. <laughs> we didn't go to any other meetings. We just like signed it there and did it at three clubs. And now we're still doing it there. And it's uh, it really worked out because that venue was really catered to us and it was all late night shows we wouldn't have to worry about doing like a heavy metal show at 2 p.m nobody's gonna go see that we had the same problem for sex in the musical i was like yeah has to be late night i'm like i'm so sorry i know but we can't do matinees yeah and your show's all about <laughs> drinking <laughs> like, they're always exactly. drinking and sex in the city heavy metal and whiskey go together like heavy metal and satan i don't know it's just like <laughs> it's like a trifecta uh and so it is that story worked happened. very well as a matinee yeah. <laughs> well, your show was also very, very family friendly, which was great. Like, I feel like that's one area where, like, the way that I write sometimes hinders my audience availability because my shows are not family friendly. They're all 21 and over. They're all very, like, I do a lot of sex on stage. I don't know why, you guys. I love sex on stage. I think it's hilarious. People are singing and having sex on stage. I've done it in all three of my shows so far, which is ridiculous. <laughs> I know, and I'm doing it in just the worst, too. I know. I think it's funny. But I think it I does, don't think it's the worst. I think it's great. It, it does, More sex on stage. It does limit All your you. audience yeah. um, if you are looking to like... <laughs> so like I said, depending on what you want to do. So I had a friend who did a musical in 2017 with plans of taking it to Broadway. So now they've been pitching it all over New York and like they did it here first as a workshop and now they're pitching it everywhere. So it depends what you want to do. Um, what we do with our shows, after we finish them, we take our best songs and we turn them into music videos and put them on our comedy parody channel. Um, which is a lot of fun. So that's kind of where I go. I actually don't know what you guys, I never asked what you guys, what your plans are. I know your show just kind of runs. Yours should be like a regular running thing. Well, we, the four of us uh, all come from the comedy community here. We're all from Second City, UCB, IOS, rest in peace, uh, PAC. Uh, and so we approached Every, we approach it as more than a band and more like a comedy theater troupe or company. Um, we like to think of ourselves more, we strive to be more like a Monty Python that plays music, you know? Um, and so our goals have always been a lot more than just like getting a record deal or going on tour, even though we would love to do those <laughs> things. Uh, we're actually now shopping it around as a limited TV show and yes. yeah so it that's like a whole nother animal trying like living with a musical for two years and then <laughs> trying to like rewrite everything for the screen it's very different so that's a whole nother thing but that's you know our goals are are to make TV and movies and always have been because that's where we come from I, I would I would say I'm one of the worst people at parlaying my my work into bigger and better things. Uh, I I think Disaster Ride would be a nice uh, indie musical film. That's where I think it it like could go. I think it could go, and if not that, just like having because I've. 
put it up a couple times already myself, just other people putting it up in other cities. And then I could I could fly out to Denton, Texas and see it. Oh, look look at these guys doing my show. I'm from Dallas. Are you from Dallas? Dallas? No, I just picked a random place <laughs> from America. Wow. Oh my god. Denton's right by Dallas. It's from I, North Texas University. But I think I think New York would really vibe on that kind of style because it is very it reminds me of like you know, like Spring Awakening, how it has this very like indie kind of cool vibe where you get a singer-songwriter who writes music for a musical. I feel like that's very much what you did. And I'm from New York, so I can stay with my mom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah, how, I want to know about a little bit more about like how you guys choose your projects and how you decide when it's time to move on to another one. Because we've been talking kind of about the lives of our projects. Never! I mean, because that's my struggle sometimes as a creative type is like, I don't know when to let go. Like, yeah. I'm like, sometimes I want to hold on so tight, sometimes I just want to throw it in the garbage. How do you guys decide? Uh, well, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, after it went up in 2012, I thought, that's it. I, yeah. really, I really thought, I did it. Yeah. And I wonder what I'm going to write next. And I've written many things. I've written, you know, pilots. I've written uh, theater and uh, songs, whatever. Uh, but um, yeah, I just I just had this itch to do it again, and and I realized that I I become a better writer since 2012. I just knew that it was in me to to make it better. So I wonder if. You know, six years from now, I'm like, wait a minute, I, I can make this even better. I, I feel pretty okay with how it is right now. I think it's, I think I'm ready to move on to the next project. I've already begun doing that. Um, I'm going to be a little resident about uh, assuming that it's ready for Fringe just because I wrote it. But I do feel like now I have the tools to make tools of my mind. My I am so relating to everything to, you're saying. Yeah, <laughs> to, to make a better piece uh, in a short amount of time, and I would advise any of you, if you just have that, you know, belief in yourself to do good work, that to go ahead and do it, and if you're feeling like, on the fence, like, is this good, I can't tell, you know, use, use the help of your friends and, and show your friends what you're working on and have readings and get actors to read it and see if it sounds better. And if you're doing the show and you cast the show, don't be afraid to change the script. After you've cast the show and you're in the space and you're in rehearsals, you will discover more things. And then when you see it in front of an audience, the audience is going to tell you if that joke is funny. Or even better than like getting a laugh is like an awe moment. like. Because you don't really, you, it's not a joke, so you're not expecting a reaction, but when they react to something that's not supposed to be a joke with like, <gasps> or, ah, oh, like you can feel that, and that's kind of more satisfying than getting a laugh at a joke. Yeah. So uh, it really helps to have your work in front of an audience to know uh, that's why Fringe is so valuable for the process, because it's a low stakes way to get an audience. Um, I am a fringeaholic, so I bring a new piece every year. Um, I know a lot of people who will do their show two years in a row, like the first version and then the next version. I will not do that. Um, I do not you know, begrudge anyone who does. That's just not my style. I like to keep presenting new work as a brand versus like being about my show. It's about my brand of writing and comedy. So every year I try to present something new. Um, usually we do... I write one new musical every year, and then kind of that year we flesh it out. So like after we did Buffy at Fringe in 2017, we actually filmed it into a web series, and then we put it online, and like now we're done. And like we kind of still go to cons, but like we're, we're done for now. So it's out there now. And then Sex and the City, we did it at Fringe last year. We just filmed all the music videos from that. That will be uh, releasing this November. Can't and then wait. Be awesome. Oh, they look so good. <laughs> and starting next year, we're actually going to be, I'm writing my new musical for Fringe for this year. Um, Game of Thrones, we kind of put on the back burner for a while, because what ended up happening, and this can happen to you, it's just the, the <laughs> name of the game. After we debuted our Game of Thrones musical, three months later, two bigger companies than us both opened Game of Thrones musicals right across the street from where we were and challenged us. And like they came for us, like they knew where we were and they changed their tour around to come and destroy us. 
They actually told me that. Yeah, they knew they about us. They told you that? Well, one of my friends, because I was like, oh, I'd love to like cross promote because you guys have one and we have one. They're like, no, they no. moved their tour here to shut you guys down. Oh. And it was, it was, it's what it is. I mean, that's the theater world can be a little dog eat dog sometimes. It's not all as communal and nice as Fringe is. <laughs> um, Fringe is like, Fringe gives you like an unrealistic expectation because everybody's like so nice here <laughs> and like so supportive of each other's works. And like out there, it's like, eh. I was going to say, tell me what those companies are. They're not allowed. <laughs> you know what it reminds me of? It's like the difference between like when you're in college and everybody's trying to learn together and then you go out to get a job and everyone's trying to like take your job. Um, so Fringe is a nice supportive place to try things out. And you know, it hurt, but they've all lost their runs now. None of them went forward. And we have actually filmed our Game of Thrones music video, so we'll be releasing those next year. Nice. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I just kind of put it on hold for a little bit. I was like, okay, okay, you can have it. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's, uh, since then, I've actually started trying to create things that people can't come up with. So with Game of Thrones, that actually was just a parody of the show. Anybody can come up with that. So it, didn't, it wasn't creative enough to like not have co competitors. Buffy Kills Edward is a brand that I created. It's a crossover of two entities, and it's a completely original storyline. So unless somebody actually steals mine, which I have the copyright to, it, we're not having competition. Um, same thing with Sex and the Musical, actually. For those of you who don't know, I wrote a prequel to Sex and the City. Um, so no one's stealing that either, because that's, that's an original idea. Even if they wrote like a Sex and the City musical, it wouldn't be. Or a prequel, even. It would probably be a different story. Yeah. Different. yeah. <laughs> um, so I would also say make your idea creative enough that other people won't take it. And if they do, that's okay. Like I said, you know, I waited a little bit, and now I'm bringing it back. It's fine. It's fine. Um, I'll actually tell you guys what my musical is for next year, because yeah. I'm not afraid to share. Uh, it's called, do you guys know that actor thing? I did not know this, by the way. You guys, I'm not an actress. That thing that you guys do, where you're like, five minutes. Five minutes, thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you, five. Thank okay, you. I didn't know this, but it inspired me to write my next show, because it blew my mind. They were all saying it like a cult. So, uh, thank you, five, is my new musical. Um, that I started writing, and it's meta. Yeah, it's very meta. <laughs> <laughs> but that's always how my musicals happen. By the way, but because I, I, I saw it on a T-shirt, and I just went home and started writing it. I was like, <gasps> it's, it's about a very gracious person named Five. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, it's actually my first non-parody musical, so I'm I'm really excited. Awesome. Uh, that's my so company's great. very excited to hear it. I'm like, oh, well, I hope it's as funny as the other stuff. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Uh, yeah, we did, like I said, we first did our show two years ago over there, and and then we did two shows, and kind of thought we were done with it, um, the election happened, and we wrote our album called Trumpocalypse, uh, you can stream it everywhere, um, and that, it, in that, it's something sort of completely different where we play the four horsemen of the apocalypse in the future and it's about us trying to take down the administration. Um, and that was, we started writing that the day after the election. So People Versus was kind of put on the back burner a little bit and then um, we decided to tinker with it some more and we brought in a director from UCB to look at it with us and he helped us uh, sort of flesh out character games because before we were sort of more like Spinal Tap where we were all just kind of the same guy where obviously they're not the same guy but there's there's not really distinguishing characteristics between Derek and <laughs> Nigel and you know they're all just kind of goofy metal, uh, metal guys yeah. yeah and so uh, UCB's big on character games and so he helped us come up with these distinguishing archetypes and so we put up a 30 minute version at UCB as a spank, uh, which is their sort of like sketch show process they're called spank shows um, that was crazy because we were doing like one minute versions of the songs and getting like quick character games in there seeing what worked, seeing what didn't um, your character was hilarious thank you oh my god uh, I'm, I'm the child, basically. Uh, and, uh, and then, again, it kind of went on the back burner again because we were uh, recording Trumpocalypse. And that went on for a long time, and then we put out Trumpocalypse, and we had no method of, like, marketing ourselves. We didn't have, like, a manager or publicity or 
you know, we're just comedians. <laughs> we don't really know <laughs> business. And, uh, and so because of that, it kind of was like put out there and, and we all went back to doing what we did. Our sketch teams, our improv classes, all of that stuff. Um, iOS was like my home for six months. Longer than that, two years. And, uh, and then one of my coworkers does Fringe a lot. And um, she was talking to me about it and I thought, well, this is a good way for us to try and like put ourselves out there to a wider audience and not just keep doing shows for our friends at comedy clubs and uh, really try to make a name for ourselves. And so that's when we started going back to the script and re-expanding it, writing the new songs. And you ask like, when do you know you're done with a project? Well, now we're outlining our TV show. So we are not done with this project right. at all. Uh, and it's been this like long two year process going through all these different iterations and like who knows when we could actually sell it and start making it and that'll be a whole nother monster. Um, but with Trumpocalypse it was very much like we wrote the songs, we wrote the sketches to go in between the songs, we recorded the whole thing in Jason's bedroom and we put it out there and it's just kind of exists now. And we play those songs live whenever we play live shows, some of them. Um, but that was a, the real challenge was uh, letting go of jokes and letting go of scenes and letting go of songs and not forcing yourself to be married to everything in the script. And that's why we can make it 60 instead of 90 minutes. Um, and that was really tough. We had a lot of late nights. It's also tough because there's four of us all writing together. And so we're all, like, we've got the, the script up, airplay through a laptop, and one person's writing, and we're all shooting ideas around. And it, you know, sometimes it can be a little bit of a too many cooks in the kitchen kind of situation, but we've been collaborating for so long that um, we've gotten good at it. Um, really good at it and uh, but because of that there were a lot of late nights where we were reworking where jokes would go where scenes would go so that narratively it would all make sense because we're juggling all these different character storylines and how to how to wrap everything up how to have like give eight characters something of an arc and wrap everything up in a satisfying way at the end so that we and even so people came up to us after the show and they were like man I really wanted this one character to like do this thing and it was like we just never fit it in uh, and it sucks um, but that's why you can do a longer version as right yeah change. yeah Exactly, exactly. That's why I say, like, whatever your fringe version is, it doesn't have to be the version that goes on. That's just the version that you're presenting, so you can kind of get a feel for... I'll tell you this, we take audience feedback um, with every show that we do. I don't get all defensive about my work and be like, you don't know what you're talking about! I listen to what everyone has to say, and I'm like, okay, that's a good point. Oh, that's something we could work on. You know, things that you might not have thought about, you know, when you were writing the piece. Um, oh, God, when we did our first one, the Tyrion thing really bothered people. We had a regular size actor playing Tyrion, and that like really made people uncomfortable. Um, so then the second time we did it, which I think was so much worse, but audiences loved it more. We had a we had him there, but we had like fake legs, and he was like in a chair. We had all these jokes where he's like, "I can't get up for reasons that have nothing to do with my costume." <laughs> we had, like, just played upon the fact that yes, this is a regular person. Um, uh, we you know you do the best you can with casting. I don't know how many of you deal with like trying to get the people you want. It's it's difficult. You can't always get what you want. I cannot tell you how many years we've been like, we really want, you know, POCs. And they're like, no, I don't want to audition for your thing. You're like, okay. Because, like, I like having more diverse casts when we can get it. But it's very, very difficult. Um, you'll find in this community, uh, it's, it's hard to get a lot of men. Like, I'll, I'll tell you the things. It's, it's hard to get diversity. It's hard to get men. Um, it's hard to get older characters, believe it or not. Uh, most of the actors are usually around the same age that come into auditions. It's tough. I've had friends that have older characters and can't 
yeah. find those roles. Um, so what I like to do, if you guys ever want casting advice, which I've gained, garnered over the years, I go see everybody's shows. I watch theater all year round, and I collect actors like action figures. And whenever I have shows or projects, I've got my roster of who would be great in all these categories, and I just offer them the role. And they're so honored that they didn't have to audition. They're like, oh, really? You want me in your show? And I'm telling you, it creates a nice morale. So I like to, and you save money on like those long audition days of eight hours, sitting watching people that humoring when you know you're not going to use most of them. Yeah. Nice. We had a proper audition for Disaster, right? Uh, <laughs> but uh, three of the people who got cast had already been in uh, shows with singing at Sacred Fools, where I'm a company member. So I'd already seen these three people on stage. There was one who I'd never seen, and he, was, he just killed the audition. Um, so, but but yeah, it's just you it's like them. you know that well. <laughs> they. They auditioned and they got cast and they stuck in the show and they stayed with it and they did it and people liked working with them. So that was very reassuring to know that because I was worried that the one person who hadn't done a Sacred Fools show before, I was like, he's, he's going to drop out at any moment. He's going to be <laughs> like, oh, I don't have time for this. I booked a gig. As, but he stayed, so I was just—I ha was, was happy. I was but ask you. I've lost people really, really close to the show. Like really soon before your yeah. show, right? Was it last year? That uh, last year or the year before? I think it was Buffy kills Edward. No, no, no. But you Maybe. lost somebody real soon before. Yeah, your show, right? like we were just about to do it, and then we lost like one of our main characters, and I had to like find somebody to fill in and just learn all the parts. Um, but you do like that's that's what's nice about having a lot of actors, and I'm telling you, like, if you're a producer, start building your your network. I mean, one of the things that's invaluable at Fringe, and I say invaluable, before I saw their shows, I knew these guys because I went to office hours every week and hung out with them, and we were buddies. So office by the time hours, office hours, office hours. Every does anybody day. not know what office hours is? Office hours is um, we just had an off season edition of Office Hours. I don't know if anybody was able to attend that, um, but. Uh, we, it's like a series of networking events, basically, that we do in the months leading up to Fringe, usually on Wednesdays, all at different bars around Hollywood. And, and it's I, just... I, I know people who had shows and never went to office hours, and I thought, you're making a big <laughs> yeah. mistake. That seems to be the common thought. This is, yeah. Because <laughs> otherwise, only your friends are going to come out to see it. And and just just having a bunch of people know that your show exists... Recognize your face, even. Like, it's show recognizing you. Yeah, know, right? hey, it's me, and knowing... Like, if you're nice to people, they're going to want to see a show just because you're a nice person. And they'll feel more connected to your show because they know you. Um, like, I, I found out this year from your husband that, like, I didn't know I was, like, a face of Fringe until he told me that. Uh, he's like, you're so popular. I'm like, what are you talking about? Because I always feel like I'm just the drunk person at office hours. But no. apparently people, like, associate my face with my brand, even though I'm not in any of my shows. But they know what kind of... Brand I do because I, I go to office hours and we chat. I, yeah. I didn't see Great. Brady's show. I didn't see Laura's show. I know who these people are though because of office hours. Of the office hours. <laughs> well, uh, and you've been to my piano bar. I've been to yeah. you. Yes. <laughs> since since because you know we're we're keeping in touch because it's a good thing to do. Uh, <laughs> You'll um, see each other's shows probably next time. Isn't yes, it? absolutely. Like, now, th there's no way I'm going to miss it this time. You can't <laughs> fit them all in is a, is a, is a big challenge. Oh, God, scheduling is so hard, you guys. Don't feel bad if you can't see everything. Do your best. It's I can't tell you how many of my friends' shows overlapped. I was like, ugh. Because like, you still have to work. You still have to live <laughs> while fringe season's happening. Um, Grady and I had to be in our shows, so yeah. that precluded us from seeing yeah. shows kind of when our shows were happening, or just before, just after, uh, so it makes it harder. I, I'm also hours. press. I, I write for Fringe Review, which is a UK-based uh, Fringe Review, review website. So um, I get to see any show I want if I write a review for it. Um, but even this year, I was like, I'm in a show. I can't see as many shows as I would like to. So I wrote less. Oh, I'll tell you guys a secret of reviews too. You guys want to know a little secret. It doesn't matter what your reviews say, it matters how many you have. I know that sounds weird. Get a lot of reviews. Get people to talk about your show. Uh, that's something I always look at when I look at shows. If I notice they only have like two or three reviews, I usually don't go because that means it hasn't been getting buzz. If somebody sees a show and they feel like they have to say something about it, you see a lot of reviews. Um, and that's usually a good indicator, even if they're not all nice. I saw one show that had horrible reviews, but I loved it and I noticed they had like 50 reviews because 
even people that didn't like it were still talking like, about it. Help talk about so like it was such a like, and I loved it, but I could see why they hated it. Like it's uh, it was just a fun, but really <laughs> over press the top. Good press. Yes. So get people to review the show. Really like pound that in. That's something that I say at the when we open the show and at the end of the show. Like <laughs> we drill it in. Um, we get a lot of reviews, and not all of them were nice. My favorite one was oh my god, what was it? Sloppy derivative pair, something bad. It was like oh, this is. Like, Oh, it was so mean. I can't even remember. It was so good. Um, <laughs> it was like saying basically it was just garbage. And I, I thought it was so funny. I was like, yay. Like we actually quoted them. We received, <laughs> we received near universal praise. You guys did. That's just <laughs> us two. <laughs> no better than I can't speak for Laura. But uh, I love my love haters, those. you guys. I do love my haters. Um, Having a sense of humor about it is great, though, because yeah. a lot of people it would bring them down. But you're like, no. <laughs> I mean, we got overwhelmingly positive, but we got, yeah. I'd say, three or four, like, hater reviews, and they make, they make me laugh. They do. I don't know, because <laughs> at the end of the day, this person was so, you know, they felt like they had to write about their feelings, and I love that, because I'll tell you, the only shows that I don't like are ones that I don't leave reviews for, yeah. to be honest. If I liked it, I'll say something nice, even if it's something short. Um, and as, as a press writer... I, I don't say mean things. <laughs> as a press writer... Our policy is if we didn't like the show, we don't post a review. Yeah. We're not here to bring anyone down. Uh, Fringe is, is a place where people can take risks and can just, I want to do a show and here's like maybe the best opportunity and I just have to do it. I, I, they're going to be spending money and a lot of time and a lot yeah. of sweat. And I, I, I don't want to, even if I really think it's, if I think it's terrible, then that's one thing. If I think it's racist, then I'll say, this show is racist, and everyone should know that it's racist, or something like that. It's <laughs> extremely <laughs> egregious <laughs> for me to leave a negative review is how dare you put this up. Fortunately, I haven't seen anything like that. I mean, you can <laughs> I think I have, yeah. You, <laughs> you can leave constructive things as well. Like, a lot of people, because they're workshopping, you can keep that in mind and be like, I really liked it. I would love it even more if I saw maybe more of this or more of this. Like, you can be constructive in a way that actually helps the other writers. Um, the times I haven't left reviews are when I just didn't really understand what I was looking at. Sometimes I yeah. see things and I'm like, okay. Just a long <laughs> I like and, and if you're writing... If you're writing your own show, it really helps to to see other shows and like yeah. see what can be done and what works and what sometimes does not work. That's how um, I learned how to write, by the way. I watched other people's shows and I saw the type of humor that gets laughs. I'm like, okay, so that's that's what you people want. Yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I can write like that. I can, I can write jokes like in that vein. Because um, there is, have you noticed that like humor shifted? Like, think about this. Like, think about sitcom television, right? Like, do you guys remember shows like Friends and Seinfeld? There was that kind of humor. And now, like, you look at The Office and uh, there was that kind of humor. And now, like, how humor changes and what people think is funny. Um, like, I watch Friends now and I don't, I don't laugh out loud, but I remember cracking up when I was young. Yeah, sure. Could it be any more outdated? Oh. <laughs> See, and now I groan and I love Chandler. But we, our humor changes. So I like to keep my, my finger on the pulse of, like, what's funny and... Uh, I'll tell you guys, by the way, if any of you are interested, um, not to make a big pitch for them, oh, but no, go for it. Serial Killers is going on right now at Sacred Fools, and they're taking pieces. Now, I will say, it is much more brutal than Fringe, okay? It is five shows enter, three shows leave, or two shows leave, and you only get to do ten minutes of your piece. But it's a really, and if you keep going, you have to keep writing a new ten minutes every week. It's really kept me on my toes as a writer. Honestly, I'm pumping out some of the funniest stuff I've ever done because the pressure is on. Um, and on top of that, it's kind of just fun to keep being in the practice of it, you know? And yeah, maybe we'll get cut this week. You know, maybe we're performing tonight. Maybe we'll be killed off tonight. <laughs> but like, it's a lot of fun and you get to kind of meet other people who are writing and see what they're doing and see how they can write really funny things quickly. Cause I mean, this is, you want to talk about writing a new piece every year like I'm doing right. this. I'm writing a new song every week, you guys. I'm doing a musical at Serial Killers. It has been so insane. It sounds like good practice. That's why I look frenzied. But yes, it's been great practice for me. And there's not like I can procrastinate it because the show goes up every Saturday. So there is no procrastinating. And it kind of forces you. Yeah. I recommend it. They, they need no, more okay. pieces. So if you guys... <laughs> and, it does, and it does not have to be a musical either. I'm actually the only musical in it. Everyone else just does plays. But it's just a way to like get a piece that you're writing 
out there and just keep writing and it's good exercise, I think. I'm sorry, what was the, um, the... It's called Serial Killers. It's across the street at, at the Broadwater. Okay. Or not across the street. Where? It's down. It's, it's down, down the way. It's, yeah. it's the longest run. Is it the longest run? 13 years. It's been gone. It's on. in its 14th season. 14th season. 14th. And when you, when you do, if you can make it to the end of the season and not die, um, they'll give you a fully produced run of your show, like a full length of all the episodes together. That's what they've done. Uh, what? Yeah, that's what, why do you think I'm competing? I, yeah. want, that, I want that prize. I want that prize. It is expensive. Um, I, I've, you want to come in? Well, I'm a, I'm a company <laughs> member at Sacred Pool, so I've participated in, in Serial Killers quite a bit. Uh, I got to the finals one year, and that was after 15 episodes of, of doing it. Wow. It's, it's, it's a great, it's like going to the gym, but you're writing instead of. I love these songs. The songs that I've been writing are some of my favorites, and I, it's because I've had one hour to write them. So it's like, you better have an idea now, because if you don't, you're in trouble. Uh, yeah, it's been the most last minute things I've ever done. And first time I've had to write without an arranger, so it's really kind of, I'm, cool. I'm out there without my floaties on. Uh, but I recommend it for anyone who wants some practice. Um, so now I want to transition over and get them asking some questions, if that's okay with you guys. Questions. Do you guys have questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, now, Hellcross, you guys talked about this a little bit, but uh, how important is the venue and picking the venue when you're doing writing a musical? Because I would imagine staging your show in here as opposed to the one upstairs or whatever, you know. So, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we we have an all acoustic show, so there were no no one was mic'd, and even the band I used brushes. <laughs> Acoustic cool. guitar. We were pretty quiet, um, so I always thought a venue like this, where the show is here and the audience is way back there, is um, maybe not ideal. That the best venue is to be in the audience and be like right up against them. Um, but I imagine that in, for Hellcross, yeah, a bar it was is, is it was so ideal. Um, there are so many options for venues, but we just, we did the black box at the Broadwater because uh, it worked when we did it <laughs> as a Sacred Fool show in that same space. Um, and we wanted to just stick with it. Um, but, you know, whatever the size of your show is, try and find a corresponding venue. I also think, think about your audience size. So if you, you want a nice full house, right, at the end of the day, so try to think about what you anticipate is going to be your turnout. And you, you can kind of guess. I mean, there are different kinds of shows. You know, if you have kind of more of an artsy piece, more of a play, um, something that's a little more avant-garde, I would say go with a smaller audience first. Try it out. If it's going to get a bigger run and you saw it was a huge hit, move up to a bigger venue. But kind of keep those things in mind. Like, we have not yet done... Sacred Fool's main stage yet. I think we're going to this year for the first time because nice. it's my fifth year doing a show, um, which is terrifying to me because that's 100 seats and you have to fill it. And it's it's a lot. It's a lot of pressure. Whereas Three Clubs was like a nice, you know, it used to be less, by the way. They used to call it 50 seats. Now they call it 65. But it was like a nice 50 seater. And I was like, yeah, we can, we can find 50 people. So like kind of keep that in mind. Um, the Full House is not for anything other than the energy. Because the energy of the show will change the energy up here. So even if you have a small house, like the one at the lounge, it's like 35 seats, but they would fill it and then you'd get this full energy of that crowd. It, it's just how it is. Um, yeah, we looked at a bunch of different venues uh, just like technical wise, uh, because we do have a projection thing at the beginning and whether we could stage everything, whether we could load everything in and out, like we had very specific technical limitations or needs with our show. So that's what I was looking for at first um, when talking to uh, Asylum and the Broadwater and all these people. Um, so that was that's the most important thing is whether or not you can do your, your show at the venue. And all the venues have their different things. Some people have PAs, some people have projectors. This room does not have a, oh no, it does have a projector. Uh, well, there's so, pros and cons to each one. Yeah, yeah, you just want to be sure that it can fit your show. Uh, but when, because it was a bar, we really wanted to do it there. And because our, 
the, the sort of shtick of the show is that the audience is the jury, and at the end of the show, the audience votes on whether or not we're innocent or guilty, and we have two different endings for being voted innocent or guilty. So we needed that intimate setting where we can engage with the audience constantly. I ended up buying a wireless microphone, and I run all around the audience <laughs> through the whole show. Uh, because the, yeah, it's awesome, and like that's like I. Investment. It's amazing. <laughs> it's my most treasured thing. I, I just need my, might actually my wireless microphone is just living three clubs now because we've got so many shows there. Yeah. Um, which may change when we change venues, but I did three clubs because of the drinking. I I know that's terrible. I like to like be close to the alcohol. Um, alcohol and also three clubs sure. has parking. That was a big deal for us uh, because. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, I don't know what all you do, but like I'm a musician, so a lot of times I'd be running to a show from work and get there one minute before showtime and have to be able to park somewhere. It can't be looking. But if you have time, it doesn't really matter. Or, you know, there's always parking if you have time to look for it around here. But sometimes I would just have one minute. I had to literally park in a lot and get inside. So for me, that was... Well, I, I wanted to also just add, or just for anybody who's, who's thinking of three clubs, I mean, the fact that it is... Bar, there's, isn't there an extra cost because they have a liquor license? No, but the, the problem with it being a bar, there's only one real issue that I found, is noise. Your show better be loud because otherwise you will hear the noise from the front bar. That was a big it's really like Yeah, it depends on what time slots you have, but let's say you had a Friday night show, you will actively hear the bar. Great. Especially what, during Fringe because that bar is packed during Fringe. Yep. What was your show... Loud was it loud enough? Uh, I, think we, I think we got there. <laughs> it was so loud. I have seen quiet shows in that space, though, that have been just totally overpowered by the noise outside. Yeah. And it's our, like, sweet, sensitive shows. Yeah. You know? And then you're like, oh, all I can hear is a bunch of people screaming. I yeah, saw you find your venue that, like, works, that works best for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. kind of thing also at a bar where sometimes people just get caught up in their own conversation, talking, drinking, and... That kind of distracts. They well, don't do that in the space. Not in no, the space. because you're back in the cabaret area, they are there to see the show. Okay. So the there's not, the yeah, that's not really okay. going on. Except for like, sometimes late night, at least with our show, because it is kind of a concert, uh, there were Any play times, within the bar, you're going to yeah. people talking. But do it like a little bit of talking. But you can do 5 p.m. But we would engage with them yeah, too. Yeah. It's okay. like, they sometimes... It's kind of the set, the setting of the yeah. show, and the feel of the show is that like audience participation, and we acknowledge that they are there, and we address them, and I get in their faces. <laughs> so like, there's a real relationship there that's happening. Um, I will say one more venue thing: if you are going to do a venue that is far away, so this area where we are now is considered Fringe Central, Complex, Broadwater, Three Clubs, Lounge. We are our own like area. There are theaters that are farther. Studio stage is far. You can't walk there. You have to drive there. Same with Actors Company. If that's where you want to do your show because you love their setup, you love what they have going on, partner up with people who have shows there. Promote each other's shows so somebody's going to come out there to see multiple shows, make the trek, and see everything there. So partner up with their audiences. So maybe they have a show before you or after you. You can do double features together. That's what we did with one of ours. Make sure that you're partnering with them. Studio Stage always does well, and they are super far away. But their shows always do well because they promote as a unit. All the shows, they're family up. And that's how you have to do it if you want a further away from Fringe Central. I recommend that to everyone that wants shows in those spaces. Yeah, yeah they've only been open for a couple of years, too. They always do well. They sold out like almost all their shows last year. And it was because, like I said, they all were like, oh, you know, we're all here at the same space. Let's share audiences, basically. Yeah, they kind of debunked the theory that if you're not in the main area, you can't do well. I like a lot of people say. would say that for a while, that if you weren't doing it right in the city, you were in trouble. That it was not going to go well, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I, do, I do see all the shows at Three Clubs because there's booze, and all the shows at Sacred Fools because there's booze there now, too. But um, I went to Studio Stage this year. I saw five shows there, but I did it all in the same day. So I would just go there, park for the day, see all the shows there in that area, and then yeah. that was my Studio Stage day. That's cool. <laughs> Does so. anybody else have any questions? Yes, in the back? Yeah, um, thank you. Everybody's been very helpful. <laughs> um, do people know in advance, because it's on your card or on your ticket, how long a show is going to be? Yes, it's in the Fringe Guide. It's in the Fringe Guide. It should be on your uh, website. It'll uh, be on your show website page as well. And you're going to tell them how long your show is. Don't know how long your show is. Don't deviate. Don't. It, it, and if you don't know for sure, go a little bit over because people are going people to. People get mad. 
people get mad because they have their next show to go to. So if you say your show is one hour, but it's actually 70 minutes, some people are going to have to leave. The nicest people that you've minutes. ever met will get up and leave your theater. <laughs> and you don't want that to I got a bad review for that. We were two yeah. minutes over. Yeah. And they were like, we were late to our next show. Like, you messed us up. We had a show right after yours. And, like, we couldn't oh, get God. in. And, you know, how dare you? And I was like... <laughs> It sounds like you. I, I, I saw a show. I saw a show two years ago that they stopped the show and made an announcement saying, "If anyone has a show to go to at this time, go now because this show is going over." And it was really embarrassed. Like yeah. it was a full house, and everyone was just oh, embarrassed for the show. What Zach said was completely <laughs> right. By the way, um, make it under, make it less for sure, yeah. because you never know what can happen during a show. There can be extra time for laughs, extra time for fill in. Like, a lot of shows start right on the money. We didn't because three clubs is difficult, so we would always have to start five minutes after our, our call time. So my show had to be 55 minutes because we knew this. Yeah. So, like, okay. plan ahead for yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And when you negotiate with your venue, you'll, you'll negotiate how much time you need for load-in and tear-down and how long your show is and all that kind of stuff. So Doors. Doors are Doors. so stressful, you guys. Yeah, you have to factor Especially the clubs. Oh my god! Because yeah. it's not like this where these seats are set. If you get too many people that come, you have to like be setting up chairs for them and like finding space for people. So yeah. think about those kind of things too, depending on what kind of show you have. Uh, you talk about asking for feedback, but it sounds like with the quick turnaround, like how did you get feedback? Opening and closing statements. Um, so they, we have at Fringe, they have reviews. So you gotta get people to leave reviews. Oh. So I would read every comment, I poured over everyone, and any kind of feedback people had, I would take it into consideration for like future versions and things when, when we could change it. Oh. Yeah, because people like station somebody at the door when people, audience is leaving, right? Sometimes people do that. Uh, make, sure leave sure make sure you leave a review. Yeah, because yeah. everybody's little, bought their yeah, ticket for your show from the Fringe site, and that's where they can leave a review. And if, you, if they included their email address when they bought the ticket, They'll receive an email immediately at the end of the show saying, did you like this show? Please re leave a review. Yeah. And then when you say thank you in your curtain call, you should say, if you like this, leave a review. Just like hammer that in. And then they, they will. Yeah, the, the best time to ask is after the show. Yeah. Not before the show. Sometimes <laughs> I, the more you ask, though. I, I, would, I would say there's something awkward about before your show starts. Hey, if you like the show that you're about to see, <laughs> then leave, leave a review. <laughs> And then it kind of sets the audience to go, all right, we'll see. We'll see about that. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, that's what, whereas, whereas if you wait until the end and When I mean before, applauding. I don't mean at the beginning of the show. <laughs> when I say before, I mean when I talk to people about the show. Oh. I talk to people about the show and I'll be like, and just so you know, like reviews are really important. So if you guys want to write something, you know, that'd be great. If you don't, that's cool too. Please come, please. You're very encouraging, like personally. Oh yeah. Reviews. I talk about like how important reviews are and things like that. I, I, I talked to the most important thing you can do with your show, they'll tell you about postcards and making postcards. Postcards get kind of scattered everywhere. Have conversations with people and you can emphasize that like reviews are really important to you at some point, you know? And then yeah, at the end of the show, you do your little speech. But I'm saying like when I was at office hours, I talked a lot about that. I was like, oh, reviews are so important. <laughs> yeah. the, something that we like really <laughs> focused on was how to make it more of an experience the whole way through and how to set ourselves apart besides just postcards. Because we are a band and we were the only like show about a band in yeah. Fringe, um, so our we had the postcards, but we also gave out buttons because we also little, came in costume. We all, we, we went to office hours, hours in, costume. in costume, in character. So everybody was saying like, "Do you meet the heavy metal guys?" Because yeah. we we're the only ones like that. So like, find that thing that sets you apart and really hammer that home, and that will get you noticed. So we would give out little buttons, and everybody loves little buttons, and bands have buttons. Um, so like we would use that as promotional material, and then before the show, we wanted to like really set the experience, because musicals are spectacle, usually. And so uh, our programs were jury summons. The front page looked like a jury summons, and then you'd open it up, and there were all our bios and everything. Uh, and the, you could buy your earplugs, and then our intro playlist was all 80s heavy metal. It was all Motorhead and Judas Priest and Black Sabbath. And like to get the audience like prepared for what they're about to see, you know, because if they come from one of their shows, 
to our show, they might not be prepared for our kind of music. <laughs> so you want to like, you know, set the tone, set the mood, make it like a full thing. By the way, I will say one note for office hours, just because I've seen a lot of people kind of not successfully utilize it. Um, and maybe you guys can relate to this, because I go to every office hours I have for the last three years. Some people just walk up and they're like, come see my show, this is my show, come see my show, it's about yeah, this. And they like pitch you, you don't pitch people. Don't we're there to drink, we're there to network. You can at some point get around to talking about your show, but like, I don't think we talked that much about your show. I just got to know you, what kind of writer you are, I got to know you. We all know why we're all there. Yeah. So it makes it easier, it makes just it easy to just to know each other, start a conversation <laughs> with a stranger and say, hi, what's your name? I know you have a show. We'll get, we'll get, we'll get to that. We'll get to it. We'll get to that. Yeah. Um, but I, I didn't have that much of a problem with with people doing a hard sell in a way. What? But also none of the opposite know how to state what your show is, right? Yeah. 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 I just had people like aggressively try to sell me their oh, show, sure. and they had no interest in mine. They just wanted to pitch to me really hard at the opening parties. And y'all gotta know, the opening party, I go there to drink, and there, we're celebrating. <laughs> we're celebrating yeah. the festival's opening. I'm not there to like be aggressively sold to. Like, it's like you know, it's like, like when you, you want her to go to your show, buy her a drink. I yes, that is a great way I will come to your show. So, <laughs> we gotta wrap this up just because yes. we're gonna we gotta okay. get go into lunch and everything. But um, lunch. maybe if you guys would mind sticking around for a few minutes in case we'll have additional questions. Yeah. But um, yeah, you can come up and speak to us. We're but we do have to break for lunch. Get okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah. come on down and talk to us.